Welcome back to Better Things with Joe Bianca. This is episode nine. I am your host, Joe Bianca. On this episode, we're going to talk to Chuck Simon, the former trainer, former assistant for Alan Jerkins. He's the host of the popular Going in Circles podcast with friend of the show, Barry Spears. One of the most thoughtful, funny, incisive industry critics we have. We had a great conversation. And later on, we're going to handicap six, count them six, Breeders' Cup winning your in races this Saturday and Sunday at Keeneland. Lots of opportunities to make money. One of the best meets out there. In the meantime, let's get to our conversation with Chuck. So excited for this next guest. Usually I try to have someone on that I don't know that much and we get to know each other. This guy and I are brothers from another mother. We go way back. We've never spoken on air. He's the host of the Going in Circles podcast and a former trainer. Chuck Simon, welcome to the show. Joey, man, it's it's good to be on, man. Appreciate it. It's great. You can tell Chuck knows me because he called me Joey. It's like nobody in the past 10 years <laughs> has called me Joey. So that's how you know Chuck and I go way back. But let's start with the good stuff. I don't know if I ever asked you about this, but how did you first get into racing? And what were some of the first horses who kind of had your heart? I got into racing basically because I grew up in Saratoga. And when you grow up in Saratoga, you're one of two ways. You either love the track or you hate the track. Yeah. There's, there's no in-betweens. People love it or they hate it. And believe it or not, there's there's, there's a, a group of people that really don't like don't like it. So, um, But from a young age, my dad used to bring me and, and uh, just kind of got hooked on it. And it's so funny because when you're younger, your world is is – everything to you and, and you sometimes don't realize other people don't have you know a, a major track one of the biggest tracks in the world in your backyard you know every summer the best horses the best jockeys the best trainers coming there and, and uh, it was something that maybe we, we took for granted a little bit but um to me it was always something i gravitated towards and i mean we used to go to the harness track we'd go to the, you know obviously to go to the thoroughbred track and um it just became something that uh you know, you catch the bug and it's hard to get away. You know, you were you were one of the first people I knew that really humanized racing for me, where I could put a face to the name that I saw in the racing forum and kind of learn from someone who lived the sport instead of it was, it was just a hobby for me at that time. Who were some of those people for you, like when you were first coming out of the backstretch that made you want to do this for a living? You know, when I first started, uh, I mean, I was getting, it's amazing to think about this. And of course, it was a long time ago, but Saratoga uh, training during the off season used to be for the guys who couldn't get stalls at the other tracks. So there would be a guy, you know, guys that you've never heard of at this point, and, and they were always desperate looking for help. And, and that's how I, I kind of, you know, got in, got in my, my foot in the door because I didn't know anything. I didn't have anybody, um, no family members that were involved in racing. I, I didn't have any friends really that, that were involved in it. And, I just kept going and you know, I kept going and looking for a job and eventually someone hired me and I wound up getting a job at the harness track for Cherie DeVoe's dad. Wow. Which was my first real job. I, I, I had, you know, muck stalls and done some stuff for, for other guys, freelance, but uh, he, he gave me a job, a job job. And I was with Trotters and um, it's, it's, it's hard to believe things sometimes come first full circle because she wound up becoming a, an assistant trainer for me uh, years later which, um, you know, it's just one of those racetrack stories. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I, I know about you that that's kind of interesting and in how it might have shaped your training career and just your career in racing in general was you were you were an assistant to Alan Jerkins, correct? The chief? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so what was it like working, working for him? And, and how did that kind of hands-on education with a legend shape your view in, of the industry? You know, I worked for, um, like I said, I'd worked for some harness trainers. I, I worked for Tommy Skiffington. I worked for Nick Zito for a little while. Uh, I worked for Pete Ferriola at Aqueduct when when he was rolling. Um, so I kind of had a, a pretty good, um, a, a lot of different points of views, a lot of different ways of training. I mean, Nick was completely dedicated to three-year-olds at that time. The Triple Crown was it for him. He didn't want turf horses. He didn't really want fillies. That was it. Pete had almost all claiming horses. Um, Skiffington had almost all grass horses. At the time, Skiffington is is like Chad Brown and Chris Clement. They are what Skiffington was uh, to the game at that point. He was really the first all-turf guy. And he had some dirt horses, obviously, but he was a, a guy that really concentrated on the turf. And we had some Shadwell horses and a lot of horses from overseas. Uh, so... 
it was a really good education for me because I got a, a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different ways of training horses. I saw, you know, complete polar opposites between Nick Zito, Tom Skivington, and Pete Ferriola. I also worked for Wayne Lucas for about six months, too, under Jeff uh, at Belmont. And Jerkins was kind of like the master's degree for me. Right. That he, of course, did everything completely different than everyone else did. And it was kind of, uh, it was, I, I was fortunate to get the job in that um, someone else's misfortune got in trouble with the law and a job opened up and, and jobs just didn't open up in that barn. And I, I got to, I jumped on it and, uh, and it was, you know, a, a life changing experience. Well, when did you decide to, to go out on your own and, and how long did it take you to kind of have enough owners where you felt like you, you could do it? Well, you know, how, how it happened for me is, is kind of a funny story in that I had worked for Alan for about five and a half, six years. Uh, in that time, Jimmy had gone on his own mm. because the first year I worked there, Jimmy was there as well. And then he got um, Earl Mack and a couple other owners gave him an opportunity. So Jimmy went on his own. So I was the head guy there for four years. And, and I brought in Fernando Abreu, uh, who, who followed me for, hell, I think, 15 years. Um, but a an agent, um, Joe Producione, who's a clocker and you know sells by sells horses and uh, been a you know race tracker his whole life, he, he one day come up to me in the in the paddock. I was schooling a horse, and he said, um, "Would you be interested in, in in training horses?" And I was like, "Well, yeah." I mean, it's kind of a, a an open ended question. I was like, "Well, yeah," you know. So, yeah. Like, uh, you know, let's have lunch tomorrow and I, I got a proposition for you. So I had absolutely no idea what he was going to tell me. So uh, we went to lunch across the street, the talk at a town deli right outside the, the Belmont stable gate. And um, he said, I, I, I'm representing a, a, a big owner out of Kentucky. He's a guy that wants to get bigger. And you might have heard of him. And, and uh, but he's got a farm. He's, he's got a lot of horses and, and he, he wants a he wants one trainer. He doesn't want to be. Uh, the the fourth string in, in a guy in a big trainer's barn, and I said, "Sure, what's the guy's name?" He said, "Ken Ramsey." So at the time, I mean, he was a guy that had some pretty good horses, but he wasn't the behemoth that he wound up being. Yeah, uh, you know, Eclipse Award leading owner, winning training titles, this and that. A thousand horses so, named Kitten all across the country. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Uh, uh, I, I was I predated the kittens. I, I got to train the Gazis. Okay, which Gazi, you know, he was a pretty decent stallion, but he he wasn't exactly kittens' joy. Yeah, but uh, I went down there, and, and you could see that he he was really eager to expand and, and to do this. And those kind of opportunities, like, just don't come around very often, um, especially when you know the, you got to remember this was kind of predating the Super Trainer era where there really wasn't any super trainers at that point, the way we see them now. Um, and I, I, I said to the chief, I said, you know, I got an offer to train horses. What do you think? And he's like, fly down, meet the guy, see what you like, and, you know, make your decision. So I went down with my dad, and we spent a couple of days. We went to the barn. We went to the, uh, the farm. And, you know, it just was one of those opportunities that was too good to pass up. And when I came back... You know, Alan Jerkin said to me, he said, Chuck, you know, what do you think? Be honest. And, and and I was like, it's a great opportunity. He said, listen, if it doesn't work out, you can always come back. And <laughs> that was, that was, um, you know, that was how I got started. And I had 14 horses to start with. The first day we sent four of them back to the farm because they just weren't, I mean, weren't horses that we, we wanted. Um, but, the uh, horses. You know, it, it was a good opportunity, and, and it was a great way to start. I mean, by the, the first meet at Saratoga. Now, this was in May. But the first meet at Saratoga, we won five races. And that was back during, the, the I think, the five-week Saratoga meet. Um, so, you know, we got the ball rolling right away. And, I mean, as things turned out, Mr. Ramsey was, was difficult. and difficult on uh, 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 He was difficult on himself in a lot of ways. Uh, and we wound up parting ways, but... It was a great opportunity, and and I, you know, I'll uh, always be grateful for giving me that chance. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I might say I might blame him for for getting me in because uh, training horses has just turned out to be. Um, it, it's amazing. Just in that twenty year period that I trained, 
because I, I stopped training in July of 2019 and I started in, in May of, of uh, 99, everything changed. Everything changed. Yeah. And almost all of it is not a positive change. It's, it's gotten much, much, much more difficult. Um, and it's, um, you know, the game shrunk a, as well. And, and it's one of those subtle things that we don't see. You know, we look back now and you can look at the Jockey Club fact book and see the full crop like plunging, but it doesn't feel like it from year to year to year to year. Right. It's one of those things that like, uh, you know, I, I remember in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004, I would go to Keeneland and I would buy horses on the cuff. Uh, Keeneland would give me credit because we always paid. And I would buy one, you know, see one I liked. I'd buy one at the yearling sale. And by the time I got home, that horse was sold. I had two, three, four owners that were all, all in. Um, 10 years later, 15 years later, I wouldn't dare do it because I, I don't know if I, I'd have to beg people to, to get involved. And, and it just got to be, um, it got to be not fun for me. Yeah. And if you're going to do something seven days a week, 365 days a year, and trainers take great risks. And, and this is something that I don't think people understand in that um, we're privy to a lot of rules and laws based upon the, the states that we race on. Very few people just run in one state. And there's all kinds of tax laws. There's all kinds of laws with uh, immigration laws. Uh, you know, the, the guys got in trouble in New York uh, the, with the Department of Labor. And I'm not defending them, but in a lot of ways, they paid people the way that we've always paid people right. in this business. Um, and there was no one, I shouldn't say no one, but uh, people, you know, in a lot of cases didn't realize that they were doing anything well. And then, you yeah. know, once you're you're made aware that you can't do this anymore, you, you can't pay people in this fashion, you have to have a clock, blah, 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 then you have to take care of business. But, um, you know, it, it was just uh, where the, the law, the Department of Labor and racing don't mesh very well because this is not a nine to five job. Yeah. And, you know, the, the care of a horse takes many forms and you need to make sure that, you know, your people are, are a, you know, showing up and doing the job properly. But you hate to rush people. And, and economics matters. It, it, it's in the end, everything comes down to it comes down to math. I said it's a lot. Everything comes down to math in the end. And even for the big outfits, you can't just um, take it on the chin expense wise because, you know, we, we still have a hard time getting paid. Yeah. There's no mechanism that really has been set up in racing to ensure that we get paid. Right. Um, and there's a lot of risk in, in the workman's comp, uh, some of the workman's comp rates. And, and New York has done a great job. I mean, I, I give the credit to um, uh, Rick Violet, especially, who, who did a lot of the heavy lifting and made the, the rates reasonable. Uh, at some point, guys were paying like 40% of their payroll to workman's comp. It's crazy. And... It's just, it, you know, there's something wrong when, as a business owner, you're better off if your employee, and this sounds horrible, but it's the truth. If your employee passes away, then if they're, they're badly hurt, because if they happen to pass away, that's covered under liability. Liability insurance is relatively cheap. Yeah. And, I mean, it's an insane thing to think, but that's how bad workman's comp uh, is in some ways. And, and, you know, racing is a very dangerous sport. Very, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're literally a, a second away from, from being hurt badly at any time. Horses can kick, they can jump, they can fall on you. Um, you know, the riders, especially it, it's, uh, I mean, look at, you know, poor Cindy Weaver. I mean, Cindy Weaver instead of a rider is, is you know, uh, on the racetrack and for something to happen to her, um, it's just uh, it just goes to show you because like I said she she's been around for a long time and she is good like and she's safe and um, you know thank God that you know she she wasn't killed and it's just how many other businesses do you go to work you know you, you go to work uh, as an accountant you don't have to worry about you know maybe a thousand pound horse falling on you today. You're telling me the workman's comp rates aren't as ex exorbitant in the accounting field. No, you have paper cuts. 
<laughs> you might staple your finger to something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, any, anywhere you got to deal with the IRS full time, that's that's no bargain either. But uh, uh, that's that's for sure. Um, but you know, this is like you know, you're you're a critic of racing. I think this is why I wanted you on this show because you know you, you say a lot of really smart things, not just on Twitter on your show. But one of the things that I think you've had that kind of personal experience about is the super trainer thing. And, you know, I think you speak for a lot of men and women who have been squeezed out of the game, just struggling to maintain a shed row. Why has the problem of the super trainer gotten so much worse over the years? And, and what, if anything, can be done about it? You know, it's funny. Um, I've said this for about 15 years now, and it's it's just math. In the end, it's just a mathematical issue in that if you have a thousand horses per se on your backside and they're divided by five people and they all have 200 or they're divided by 50 people all have 20, what do you think is going to get you better racing? 20, you know, 20 tra- or 50 trainers trying to, to get in a race or, or, or five. And somewhere along the line, and, and um, I like, it's funny. You know, I appreciate you, the kind words, but there are a lot of things that I said were going to happen that happened. But I got to admit that one thing I never saw happening was um, the the partnerships of the billionaires. Never saw that happening. And it was one of the things that I always thought would prevent the super trainer thing from really taking off because, hey, I'm a billionaire. I own these 35 horses. And I got to play second or third fiddle in my own barn. Like, I, you know, I never foresaw those guys saying, hey, we should all, you know, join together. Yeah. Because if I was a billionaire, I wouldn't be partners with anybody. <laughs> you know, like, that's the whole point of being a billionaire. Is not not, yeah. Never saw that coming. And, and that really kind of makes it difficult. Uh, I, you know, tracks ignored their own rules. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, Naira... Uh, 35 years ago, Saratoga was kind of a dumping grounds for the horses that, that couldn't qualify for stalls at Belmont or, or Aqueduct. And now it's it's reversed. And because of the size of the facility, the uh, trainers really, the bigger trainers, don't have to say no. And I don't blame the trainers for taking the horses. I mean, they're playing by the, the, the lack of rules that exist. It just becomes a math issue. And... Uh, you want competitive races, you have to create, um, you have to create more, more, uh, outfits that, that have a chance because as it is now, you know, it's like five or six guys and then, you know, maybe one guy will get a horse here and there, but it's just, uh, it makes it difficult. Well, it's, you know, it, it hurts the wager. It's like, yeah, well, that's the thing. It's not really good for anybody except for the super trainers. It seems like, and even then it could be, a, I could see it being a pain in the ass in some regards, yeah, the smaller fields, like if you're an owner and you're now like third or fourth on the shelf, you know, for a tra- own trainer that maybe has a new owner and is trying to impress that owner and wants to get that horse out to the track first, it really doesn't seem like it's good for anybody. So what, you know, is there a solution other than just limiting barn size? Like, and that, you know, that brings in the whole argument about, you know, whether or not that's restricting free enterprise and, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of libertarians on the back stretch that would have a problem with that. Like, what do you think? Is is that the only solution? Well, free enterprise really doesn't isn't it really doesn't it's not pertinent because free enterprise basically deals with government and the government isn't involved in that. Um, the, the rules that on, on stall limits were always track rules. The tracks decided that they would, would relax them. Um, I mean, I thought of something a couple of months ago, and I've been a critic of HISA. And I've been a critic of HISA because, and, and I believe in the concept. I think the concept is fine. I, I mean, the concept makes a, a tremendous amount of sense. But I believe HISA is operating at about 30% of where they should be operating. And not to go into too many other subjects, but like, you know, the jockey issues. Like, why has, why has the using, A, they're using, you know, much, much kinder sticks. And B, why is that such an issue when herding is a far bigger uh, safety issue? I mean, it's it's not even like, they're not even in the same ballpark. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the things that HISA could do being that you have to register your horse. 
now. There you, no, there's no getting around it. I guess if you live in Texas, you can get around it, but I don't know how long that's going to last. West Virginia. Um, but um, you could set up rules saying that a trainer is only allowed to to have a hundred registered um, horses in his in his under his control. I mean, it could be done, and I'm sure that the lawyers will all roll their eyes and this and that. But every sport has limits. Alabama can't have three hundred guys. It seems like they do, <laughs> but you know they, they they can't have that. And the problem isn't that the the the, the super trainers. Uh, are getting the best horses. The best trainers always got the best horses. Yeah. That's not anything new. Woody Stevens didn't train a bunch of maiden 15s. You right. know, Charlie Whittingham wasn't out claiming 5,000 yes. trainers. The problem is that those guys now have, have everybody else too. They have the second tier horses and they have the maiden 30s and they have the claimers. And and, and that's really one of the problems and that, that exists. I trained a lot of B-team horses over the years. Um and now those those horses aren't even available. They they go to the big trainers, and yeah. it doesn't make a, it doesn't make sense for the owners because they're paying far more expense wise for horses that really don't. It, it makes no sense. Yeah. You know, there's there's no point in paying one hundred fifty dollars a day plus 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 for horses that are going to run for made in twenty five. Yeah, all that's doing is you're you're helping the trainer boost his stats, which is fine. But you know, the, it, it, it economically it makes no sense, and in a game where most owners are kind of upside down. Um, it, it's one of the fascinating things to me. Uh, a guy told me one time that he had a couple horses that he thought I would do well with, but he didn't want to upset his trainer by taking them. And I said, you know, let me see their PPs. And, and he, he showed me their PPs. And, and the trainer was Todd Bledger. And one was a horse that was consistently getting beat for Maiden 20. And one was a four-year-old horse that never started and, and wasn't, you know, wasn't working lights out. <laughs> And I said to him, I said, do you think Todd's going to get mad about those two horses? <laughs> you know, like, like, he might have forgotten he even trains yeah, those two. For you know? like, like, Please, yeah, someone I take these horses. Yeah. Do you think he's going to say, oh, you know what, those guys, that guy took those two. I'm not going to train his steak horses that good anymore. I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a bad job with them because I'm mad about those two. And it, it's just, um, it's, it's just, it's just a strange dynamic to me. Yeah. But, uh, but it, it, it is an issue, but. I mean, it's an issue that the game has to, everyone has to get on, on board. And, and you know, as well as I do in this business, it's almost impossible. Uh, I mean, if we, if, if the government said, Hey, horse racing people, we're going to, we're, we're going to give you guys a billion dollars here. Here it is divided up. No one would ever get anything because we would spend the next two years arguing over who should get water. The billion would be lost in legal costs. They would we would spend it on legal exactly. costs. Oh, well, you know what? Oh, I, I, I ran you know more horses than you did, or blah 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 blah. And I mean that's the thing is like so many of these issues. Um, you know the other part about Heisa too is that like, we're creating issues like the shoe rule. Like if 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 the state came out and said okay. You have to use only this brand of tire, this this style of tire. No one can use anything different. You say, all right, fine. Where do we get it? Well, no one's used them ever, ever before. We, we don't use those, so you have to make them. So how do you know that they're better than the ones we're using? Because, like, the for the shoes, the toe grabs, four-millimeter toe grab shoes. And, I, I, I mean, I trained for all these years. I've been on the backside for, for, you know, my whole life. I had no idea how many millimeters of toe grab was. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like something that, that that's like you say, oh, well, you know, how many millimeters is your toe grip? No, no one ever says that. Yeah. And most everyone had gotten away from the big quarter horse toes and they used Queen's place. And there was no reason to change that. It's essentially the same thing. And a blacksmith told me, because uh, I said to him, I said, what's the deal with the four millimeter uh, toe grabs? He goes, I have no idea. So what do you mean you have no idea? He goes, uh, they don't exist, Chuck. I said, what do you mean they don't exist? He goes, nobody makes four millimeter toe grabs. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, that's that's why we're all, you know, sitting here saying, well, we have to use these, but, you know, we don't even have them and the manufacturers are struggling to make them. And that's just something like, like of all the issues we have. Yeah. Like that's yeah. a creation that, that we created issues and that. And someone asked me this this morning, um, 
talking about the the rich strike yeah. uh hot rod charlie controversy so well if that horse had toe grabs on you know would it give him an advantage i said well it probably gave him an advantage i go but i can't tell you and i don't think anyone else can tell you if it's a uh, um a uh, half of 1% advantage or a 1% advantage or I mean, how would anyone know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like this is, we've been racing horses for a hundred years and, and this is never something that anyone ever cared about. Yeah. And it's just, uh, it's baffling because I, I don't know. I, I, I can't answer the question because how would, how would you know? Well, that's the thing is like, you, like you say, we're creating issues, whether it's that, whether it's arguing about Lasix for 20 years whether it's the banning the whip in certain jurisdictions at certain tracks, like we're creating these things that within the industry, like who gives a shit about toe grabs? Like I'm, I've been watching this week, the controversy from the rich strike, hot rod, Charlie thing. And it went from people yelling at Sonny Leone for leaning over into Tyler Gaffney, which is a legitimately dangerous thing to now everybody's arguing about the shoes all day and all night on Twitter. And I'm like, who could possibly care this much about this? And I want to transition from that to me, to what I think is the biggest issue in racing, which is drug trainers, juicing trainers. And I, I think that, you know, we do a lot in racing without, you know, fixing that core issue. And, you know, that I kind of think back to the service in Navarro stuff where everybody in racing knew what they were doing. It was painfully obvious. We all had to sit there with a straight face and pretend like their success and their win rates were legitimate until the FBI came and busted down their doors. And then we could all speak freely about what we all knew was going on. So you're not a fan of Heisa. I, 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 I take that from you, but what do we do? What do we do? Cause there are definitely still certain guys, certain big name trainers who I won't say, so we don't get sued, but certain big name trainers who I am almost certain are cheating. What do we do? Is there, is there any solution? I'm not, not I'm not, not a fan of Heisa. I'm a fan of the way Heisa has been set up. Um, I think that's a, that's a problem. Yep. Listen, they could have asked me. I would have sat in the corner and not said a word and took notes and given it to them and helped them out of a lot of the situations they got them, themselves into. I said this a long time since this whole thing kind of got rolled out. I've watched football my entire life. I played football for one year, and I got buried by a, a pulling guard. I was a 160-pound defensive end. <laughs> so that was it for me. My career was over. But I, I've watched football my whole life. I am far from an expert on football. Yeah. And if Roger Goodell called me up and said, Chuck, I want you to set up rules for for the NFL. I would have to bring in coaches, players on both sides of the, the, of the field, kickers, uh, specialists, referees, you know, get a, get a consensus of people and say, all right, what are the rules that you guys think can be improved on? What are the rules that you guys think um, are you know are, are no good? What are the rules you think should be expanded on, and how do we make this better? But no one's asked anyone that really knows what the hell they're doing, and that's the problem. I look at these boards and they're all very very credentialed people, and they're very smart people. But if you gave any of those people fifty thousand dollars and said you need to wager every penny of this for the next you know month. And do you think any of them would not lose all the money? <laughs> right? And, and wagering is, is part of, of racing. So they're very smart people, but they don't know how to wager. And none of them really know anything about the backside. And even the veterinarians, the vet, you're getting people from, from clinics. Yeah. And it's like, I, this is the problem I have is that why not? Make and, and I understand the politics behind it, but at some point, and, and this goes, you know, this is our whole country without any consensus forming, without any compromise. Like, we just get to these, you know, in these corners, whether it be politics on a state level, a national level, or, um, you know, horse racing. Horse racing has gotten a lot more political, and it's, you know, Lasix is bad, and this is good, and you know, whips are bad and the animal rights people are going to do this. And, and it just is like a political argument instead of a, a business argument. And in the end, if you make the business stronger, 
then we're going to have a better chance in the future. If you weaken the business, then you're going to have a, a less of a chance. And and I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming at it now from, um, I, I mean, I'm sure I have all that experience as being a trainer, owner. I bred horses. I sold horses. I bought horses. So, I mean, I have plenty of experience in that, you know, that, that, that area. And lots of other people do. But from the outside now, looking from the outside in, you say to yourself, what are we doing to move the game forward that's not just lip service? Because, yes, Navarro and Service were mocking the game in their own ways. But we kind of got them by mistake. Yeah. And what are we doing now that's going to change that? Because I don't know, and maybe there's some grand plan that, that will, but surveillance on the ground is the first thing that has to happen. Testing is never going to be... We're not testing humans. We're testing animals. And the unfortunate part is that um, they can't talk. So we know where they are 23 and a half hours a day. I mean, it shouldn't be that hard. Yeah. You know? But I think a lot of tracks, because it comes down to the tracks in a lot of ways. A lot of times the racing commissions, they're just not equipped to do it. I mean, Florida, hell, we don't even, you know, we just got a racing commission. Like, a couple months ago, they had um, a division of paramutual wagering as part of the division of business, uh, which had 38 separate chapters under you know, the, the state of Florida. So, this wasn't going to ever be a, an organization that could have a, a real stringent um, investigative force. They just they didn't have the budget. And, you know, we, we, we struggle in the legislatures all over the country. And, I mean, think of uh, the horse racing, um, let's call them what they're, slot machines in Kentucky. It was a little dicey <laughs> that those things were going to get passed. And, and it did. Yeah. It wound up going, getting through, obviously, to the, to the benefit of the industry. But it was not a slam dunk. That's in Kentucky. And yeah. what yeah. racing really can't afford to do is get involved in politics because we're just going to be, uh, we're just going to be the surfers on the wave and it's going to take us where it takes us because we don't, we don't, we're not strong enough. We don't have the lobbying power. We don't have the voting power. We don't have the organizing power that literally everyone else does. Um, and it's just, uh, it's a little bit tricky, but you know, the tracks need to come to the table and do it. I just don't know how, um, and, and you know, I'm hoping that Heisa does do that because that's something that, that really needs to be done. I mean, listen, rumors have been part of this business since the 20s. The spit box is known as the spit box because they used to put heroin underneath horses' tongues. That's why the, that's where the test barn is. And we're talking in the thirties and forties, you know? Wow. So there's, there's always going to be people trying to, to gain an advantage. Um, and like you said, it, it's, what are we really doing? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, um, the only thing I can think of is, you know, the parks raids, you know, that's something that I've seen. That's like an actual tangible thing that's being done to stop people from using syringes or batteries or whatever. And just, you know, last week it was their biggest, weekend of the year at the Pennsylvania Derby and the fact that people were still trying to cheat and that they caught them was like, you know, on, in one, on one hand, it's, it's pretty sad and a pretty big indictment of the people we have training in this business. Some of the people, on the other hand, I think it's a positive development that even though it's a negative headline in the short term, long term, like you say, surveillance, that's how you catch people because they're always going to be ahead of the tests. Yeah, and we don't even know what those guys had. Yeah, you, you can't have syringes; that's illegal. Period. Yeah, but we don't know if they had ace promosine in those things, and they were using them because they were just cheap. Yeah, and uh, you know, like that's the whole that that's what got Rick Dutro in trouble. Um, and you know, Dutro got uh, an unreasonable sentence versus you know many other people with with far less transgressions. It's difficult though for me to explain to people why. You know, I'll say her name, Linda Rice is still training when her license was revoked six months ago or eight months ago. 
And of course, the reason is because as a citizen of the United States, she has rights and the rights allow her to appeal or, or get an injunction and, and continue to train and appeal um, the decision, which is made by a state body, a government body. So it's going to take a long time. I understand that. I get it. But you have a hard time explaining to people why that person is still here. And it's, it, it's, it's not just here. Uh, look at Christoph Sumian, right? He elbows the guy. He gives him the, the flagrant two foul <laughs> on the backside, right? They let him ride the art card, which is the biggest card of the year. Yeah. And now we read today, he's coming here and he's riding the Keeneland in, in the, the, uh, the maker's mark. <laughs> and you say to yourself, man, this guy's business is picking up. <laughs> after right. Yeah. Well, you know, like, 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 where's the penalty? And, and this is a, a, obviously it happens in a different jurisdiction in France. And, and they gave him two months on that same day. Yeah. It was, but it was two months, but, and, and it, it, it even goes back to um, the rules that we have here for jockeys when they get suspended, uh, where they're allowed to ride in designated races. Yeah. Well, you know, the top guys, I mean, Mike Smith, he pr probably prefer to be suspended all the time, where he, he can only ride in designated <laughs> races. And people stop asking him to ride in those other races, you know? Uh, you call me. Didn't you hear I'm suspended? Click. <laughs> you're going to work a horse and I'm suspended <laughs> yeah I mean they can basically jockeys can pick what days they want to be suspended like imagine if that was any other sport and like you had, you had Fernando Tatis was like I'll be suspended in the off season is that yes. alright okay, right? yeah, let me see how the season plays out maybe I'll take the last month and, you know, exactly. I got a third year anyway but yeah, no, it's it's um, <laughs> it's it's difficult to explain and uh, I, I mean I've been a proponent, and it's it's not easy to do. I mean, there are things a lot of times we talk about, well, we should do this, we should do that, we should do this. It's not always easy. And that's the one beauty of HISA is that we can supersede all the states. Right. I'm sick of hearing about uh, Scott Cheney telling me about the, oh, in California, the rules of racing say you can do this and, you know, you can basically annihilate horses out of the gate because of the rules of racing in California. Well, why are the rules of racing not the same everywhere? Yeah. That's that that should be the one basic thing because essentially all of our racing, no matter what track it's at, is the same. They all leave from a gate, they all run around a turn for the most part, and, and they, they go to the wire. Like why that that would be the easiest of all the rule changes to to make. And I mean, I've been a proponent that Heisa should have taken that from from the start. And it should be like the NFL or the NBA. And yeah, there's issues in those sports too. But the difference is that they are trying to do it professionally. And we have this scatterbrained system that doesn't work. There's no oversight. There's no, um, you know, it, you made a call, you made a DQ, or you didn't to make the DQ. There's no explanations that are going to a central office that's saying, well, you guys, you did the right thing in this case, or no, you missed it. You should have done it this way. Without that, without um, supervision, without oversight, without being on a common uh, you know, rule book, we're going to have these, these situations where, um, as a player, you and me and everyone out there, we're watching – this race go off at this track and this race go off at that track. And then this race goes off at this track. So for us, our horse racing world is all these races. And to say that, um, in this state, you're allowed to do this on, on, you know, herding wise in this state, you're not. That to me is a, b a bigger deal than if Butte was a 24 hour drug in one state and a 48 hour drug in the other state, because in the end, no one really knows yeah. that it's something that happens. It's, it's a given. It just is very f tough for a guy to understand why one horse was taken down when one horse wasn't. And a, a lot of times the explanations just aren't, um, you know, they, they, they come and they're like, man, I, I still don't get why they did it. And, you know, Pat Cummings, my friend, is a huge proponent yeah. of the category. We one. argued about it last week on the show. He was on the show with me. We talked about it. I, I said, Pat, I said, you know, what we should do we should start a cottage business. We, we should buy life insurance for the jockeys. Right. These guys are going to be like, if you're going to tell them, hey, you know, 
uh, we're going we're gonna to suspend you or we're going to take days, you know, we're going to give you days, but, you know, we're not going to take the horse down. Yeah. I mean, our biggest races will be like, <laughs> it'd be like roller derby. I, know. I, know. I made the exact same point to him. And, you know, he's, he's very in favor of, of those rules. But you, like you're saying, there's a lot of ambiguity and not, not, not a lot of uniformity. But I think there are certain things that should be black and white and should be punishable by, for, for major periods of time. Like I think about the Peter Miller thing in California when he takes a vacation, quote unquote, air quotes if you're listening to the, the audio version of this. And then he's, he's back in six months and it turns out he was training all along and he gets a seven day suspension. I don't want to hear about the CHRB statutes and all these all this, these technical reasons for why a guy who was scamming the betting public as blatantly as you can possibly be. Now, listen, everybody in the know knew what was going on again, like everybody who, who had any kind of inkling who Peter Miller is and who Ruben Alvarado is knew what was happening. But if you're a newer player and you don't really know those guys, you were being scammed by by the, the, the racing form telling you this was being trained by a different trainer who was not a leading trainer in California. Why on earth can't that be more than seven days when it's something so black and white? Yeah, uh, I remember when I worked at Yonkers, I worked at, when I got out of the University of Arizona racetrack program, my first job was at Yonkers in the harness track. I was assistant racing secretary. And if you were a guy that was suspended, and water training, and you, you you know, had a beard trainer, what they call them. Yeah. Like, they would rule you off, like, pretty much indefinitely yeah. if they found that out. Seven days he got. Yeah, and racing just does a poor job of, of, of just explaining what's going on. And there are, there are situations, and this was, again, why I think Heisa should be involved in this, in that you have uh, a lot of states have maximum penalties that they can give. They can't fine a person more than X amount. They can't um, give a person more than X amount of days. And that makes it difficult. Uh, I, I mean, you know, we're going back to um, guys who are ruled off at one track and not ruled off at another track. Yeah. On, on private, you know, private property rights. Those are difficult things to understand, and and that's you know that's something that that racing because there's no central structure really struggles with because a lot of the, the tracks are very very sensitive. Uh, I mean you know like, like racing in this business, this is the most super sensitive business I've ever seen in my life. I was about to ask I mean, about that. Yeah, it, it's just people. You want to be a real world sport, and I've said it all the time with people on Twitter, and it gets met. We're not really a sport. Like. No. If, if, what, what went on today at the racetrack at Parks and uh, Delaware or wherever? No one's going to watch that for the sport of it. This is a gambling activity. This is a, a, a state-sanctioned wagering activity that just happens to have a, a race involved. Yeah, like, sure, the Breeders' Cup, the Derby, the top horses, different story. People are always going to watch those kind of races, uh, and, and they bet they bet them like mad. Yeah. This is a gambling country. Yeah. And it's, it's, and know, for so many years we had to like turn the other cheek and, you know, we've got the NFL telling us, uh, you know, we don't believe in gambling. Meanwhile, you know, quickly you know, that turned. It's, yeah. and now it's yeah. nothing but sports book ads. Nothing. Meanwhile, if a team puts out a, uh, an injury report that, and a guy isn't really injured, they'd fine him like yep. half a million dollars. I know. But, you know Guy beats his girlfriend. All up. these that guys are Jimmy the Greek now, like Phil Sims. All these guys are Jimmy the Greek now. When two years ago it was verboten, <laughs> that's amazing. It was all. It was always kind of like yeah, we're pretending like yeah. you know, no one ever played football. But um, I mean, it's a gambling country, and and this sport yeah. has been very, very. I just call it a sport, but you know, the, this business has been very. Um, even now, even yeah. now, we we don't do enough. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we talk about uh, this is a new issue, too. This is something that didn't happen 20 years ago, the, the late odds changes. Yeah. And the frustration. And and I know what some of the guys say, some of the sharper guys are correct in that, yes, if you read the daily double uh, probables or sometimes the exact probables, horses are, that are overlays are going to get bet. But they're getting bet because there's guys with algorithms yeah. betting it. And like at least Naira, I'll give them credit for 
for shutting them out of the wind pool because the wind pool is really where it's most um, obvious, yep. especially when it's on the screen at the top of the stretch and the horse clicks down from four to one to five to two. <laughs> you know, it just gets people. It, it's the mental thing because this is a mental sport. I mean, you know as well as I do. You go through a long losing period and you're handicapping and your betting gets affected because, you know, you're just, you know, that's why, like, it's like for me, it would be impossible to do this professionally. Yeah. Because I can't take the losing streaks. It's hard. I, I, I'm like, I'm kind of like a level better in that I don't push the envelope too much. Um, even when I'm winning, I don't just start, you know, uh, I'm comfortable with, with, you know, $100 to win. I don't start betting 500 to win because I'm on, on a good streak. And you probably should. ITP will probably tell me. I'm, it'll give me all the uh, all the reasons why I'm right or wrong. But, but You're such a Twitter people, guy, ITP. <laughs> you got nicknames for people on Twitter. I don't, can't, I can't even believe I know who that is, but I do. I do. You do know who it is. Yeah. He's, he's semi-famous. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing about him is, is – his 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 delivery is horrendous, but his uh, a lot of what he says is a hundred percent true. Yeah, no, he's a sharp. I'll guy. be honest, he helped my play. Yeah, I, I remember, uh, you know, last year I did really well at the Meadowlands, at the the, thir- the harness, not the thoroughbreds. Last year I did really well at the, at the harness, and I made a couple scores, and I did it because I didn't spread, and I I, I kind of you know pushed the envelope a little bit and, and, and made my plays and made them stick and, and they hit, you know, and so I won, I won, I won more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's part of, you know, gambling, but, but the mental aspect of seeing odds change, it just gives you that the, the first thought process in your mind is always somebody's betting after. Yeah. Somebody's, somebody's past posted. Um, it's is it that far out of the realm of possibility in 2022 with people are hacking into everything that someone couldn't hack into our system our better so are, are we saying that <laughs> that the the paramutual systems <laughs> that we're using in horse racing are 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 stronger than banks and stronger than the defense system, uh, department and and all these other places that have been hacked into Paul Pony would say no yeah i mean listen that's it's, it's such an interesting case because it's the only it's the only bet it's the only winning bet you can make on anything where you feel like you lost. Like that's a special thing to be able to make winning betters feel like they lost. Only racing could could get could concoct that experience for for betters. But yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about your your wagering because you know I, I know you from hanging out with you and your dad at Saratoga. And I know your dad was a big handicapper. You know, how how has your handicapping style evolved over time? Like, I know you're not technically supposed to bet when you're a trainer, but I'm sure you would place a couple of bets down. What? How has it evolved over time? Well, I think you're, you're allowed to bet as a trainer. Really? You just can't bet against your own horse in your same race. But how could that possibly be policed? I, I mean, whatever. It can't be. It's, it's not. Yeah. I mean, I, honestly, guys like Julio Canani, he was probably the third biggest better in Southern California when he was, there you go. When he was rolling. Um, but, no, I was never, uh, you know, I was never like that. But, uh now I have a lot more time. When I was you're, when you're training, you just don't have that much time, right? You know, you're getting up in ungodly hours. You, you know, you're you're working, and and then like I I was never a person that could sleep in the daytime. I couldn't nap, so you know, you'd be up all day, go back to the races. Then if you had clients or you had something going on, you know, you wanted to have a, a little bit of a life. You know, you you went out to dinner or something. Next thing you know, you're home nine ten o'clock, and 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 you're starting all over again. Yeah. So now I, I have more time to look at the PPs than, than, uh, than I did then. But, um, you know, I, I try to concentrate on, on a few tracks. I, I'm not, I like Barry, my partner on the going in circle show. I know you've had him on. He, he's amazing. He can handicap literally any track in the world and win. I'm not saying he wins all the time. At, you know, I'm not saying he's profitable at the Australian harness, but <laughs> He, he cashes tickets and it's crazy. He called me or texted me one day. It was like real late at night, embarrassingly late at night for us to be texting each other, talking about gambling. But uh, it was, it was past midnight and he's like, dude, they're not paying off this, this, I hit the try at the, you know, Australian B. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. It's been 45 minutes and they're not paying me. You think they're not going to pay me? 
<laughs> Anytime you get into Australia A, B, or C, you know that's it has that wasn't the, that wasn't that wasn't the plan A for that day's betting. You know, one of the funniest things you talk about my dad, and and my dad's funny because my dad likes the little tracks. He says, you know, I got no shot at the big tracks. He goes, you know, there's guys they're watching every angle. They got they got drones watching the horses, and you know, he goes. So, so he likes the Finger Lakes and Indiana Grand. He's got this Indiana Grand fetish, and um, they have to you know, take out. He he, uh, he he watches the races. You know, he watches the replays and, and all that. But you know, sometimes he has trouble sleeping. And um, I remember this is about I don't know ten years ago, and my mom pulled me aside. I came to Saratoga for a visit. My mom pulled me aside. She said, You're "All serious." Like, you know, we have to talk about your father. So I'm thinking, oh, man, it's like a health issue. Because my dad would be like the last person, you know, to, to say anything's wrong. So I'm thinking, what's wrong? You know, is he, uh, oh, no, no, he's, he's, he's healthy as a horse. He goes, I think he has a gambling problem. I said, what? He goes, I caught him the other night about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was like, yeah. And he goes, he was up betting races from New Zealand. And I was like, okay. Like, why do you think he has a problem? Chuck, what does he know about New Zealand? He doesn't know anything. What, how, how do he know anything about New Zealand racing? He said, he's up at 2 o'clock in the morning betting. I think he has a gambling problem. I said, Mom, my, da- my dad, you know what he'll do? He'll, he'll fish through the, the place pools to see, like, if a horse is underlaid in the place pools. And some of those late-night races, sometimes the whole place pool is, like, 200 bucks. I said, Mom, he bets, like, 10 bucks a night. I think... If this is gambling problem is his biggest problem, I think you're in pretty good shape because <laughs> he doesn't handle very much money. And, you know, and my, you know, so I told him and he's like, well, what else am I supposed to do at two o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> that's only natural. Indiana Grand and New Zealand. That's the handy. That's, that's the handle split. It's so funny. People say, oh, well, racing, you know, hasn't been brought into the new era. Man, at five o'clock in the morning this morning, I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, the, the happy valley races there you go on my phone you know like you could be walking down the road at three o'clock in the morning betting races from korea yeah like 20 years ago man wasn't happening when when, when i was a kid oh man we used to have to the things we used to have to do to make a bet the places we have to have to go i remember on on palm sunday i drove from belmont to um this and this was this was i was working for Pete Ferriola, I believe. I, I drove from from uh, from Belmont to uh, Garden State to bet uh, some horse in California who had gotten a bad trip and there's some some kind of thing. So I, I had to drive all the way because Meadowlands wasn't open either that day. So I drove all the way to Garden State to make a bet on a horse who probably you know who who lost, I, I believe as well. But I mean to think nowadays. You don't have to do anything. We could make a bet right now. Well, Steph, you said you still can on Palm Sunday here. This yeah. like puritanical nonsense law is still in effect in New York where you're not allowed to even open your wagering account on Palm <laughs> Sunday or Easter as if this is Salem, Massachusetts. Someone explain that to me, please. You know, I went to Catholic school and I don't remember Palm Sunday being that big of a deal. Yeah. <laughs> even if you're religious, like, come on. I, Palm Sunday is it's like it's you know like uh, all right I get Easter but I mean, I mean yeah. Palm Sunday it's like yeah well I've, and the Garden State story is is funny because you know I, friends of mine have taken that bus down to Atlantic City plenty of times so there's there's all sorts of you know c- commonalities there but we got to get out of here just because we're we're taking up too much time and I'm, I'm you know I love talking to you but I wanted to be able to plug going in circles before we go because it's a great show and you and Barry do a great job. What what made you want to get into the world of podcasting other than how notoriously lucrative podcasting is? <laughs> That's right. I mean, <laughs> we're doing this from uh, from the Isle of Man because I'm ducking the IRS. <laughs> Actually, uh, Jason, Jason Bidas, um, Jose Lescano's agent, who's a friend of mine for forever. And he actually was my first employee when I, when I uh, went to – he was working for Jerkins. And he'd worked for Shug and Rich Shosper before. And when I went to Kentucky, he, he went with me. So he, him and I, he was my first my first employee. But um, he called me up. It was right during the pandemic, uh, like late April. So about a month into it, when we were just like everyone was totally bored out of their mind. Yeah. And he's like, you should do a podcast. And I was like, yeah. 
So I didn't even know how to do it. You know, I didn't know how to, to get on or, or anything. And, and I, I said, eh, let me look it up. So I found um, the app Anchor, which is really easy to do. I mean, it, it's like idiot proof, believe me. Yeah. I could figure it out. Anybody could figure out it. It's super easy to do. And, um, you know, we, we, I did one. And, and uh, I think the first show I did was like 10 minutes. I don't even remember what I talked about. It was rambling, like I do. But um, a couple weeks into it, um, I was, you know, I talked to Barry and we met online. Yeah. I mean, we met, uh, through, through Twitter, Facebook, um, another racing Twitter love story. Yeah, man. He, he, Barry had asked me, you know, ask questions, trying to, to, uh, you know, get answers for things. There's a lot of things that racing does, um, poorly. And one of the things is, is really educating like people as to what the hell is actually going on. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think, again, that's a, that's a lack of a central, you know, a central body to to do that. Everyone kind of thinks, well, the other person should do it or, you know, this group should do it or why should we do it? But, but anyways, Barry and I met and, and um, I, I was like, man, this guy is, is, a, is a really sharp guy and, and he's he's well spoken. And we had a lot of other, you know, commonalities as well. Um, and I was like, hey, you know, would you want to you want to do the show with me? So we did a test run and, and it went really well and, and it got a lot of good feedback. So I said, well, you're, you're the co-host. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the pay's not great, but uh, at least we're not going to put you in a different tax bracket. But um, no, it's been great. And, and uh, we, we try to cut it down a little bit and we get going sometimes and, and we get rolling. But um, I used to do two shows, but it just got to be, uh, there's so many podcasts out there. Yeah. And a lot of, there's a lot of good podcasts. They just get lost sometimes. Yeah, and a lot of people interview do do interviews and they're great. And and actually, it's it's something that's probably underrated. And and I know we all make fun of them a little bit. And the guys who make picks sometimes they just get to be like tedious. But um, uh, it just is you know like for us it's just us talking basically. Yeah, and you know we try to I try to bring the that educational part of to try to explain like why or why this is or why that is and you know sometimes i'm right sometimes i'm wrong but at the very least you're going to get uh the viewpoint of someone that has experience and and i'm going to try to explain why this should work or why this won't work and Mm -hmm. and barry's got a lot of strong opinions too and and the handicapping wise uh he comes up with horses man and i'm telling you sometimes like i i I give up turf sprints i just don't even handicap them anymore I just said, Barry, just, just, you know, <laughs> tell me what to do. <laughs> tell, tell me, tell me how to get live here because they just, they, they just, I, 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 have a, I, have, I can't figure out what to do. Like my handicapping theory is I, I like to figure out the race and how it's going to set up and who should be where they should be. And for turns, it just seems like it's chaos, you know? And I'm like, how did that horse wind up on the lead? And, yeah. You know, but uh, no, anyways, Golden Circles, we do, we tape it Monday night and it's usually out late Monday night, Tuesday. Um, we're, we're, we're playing around with doing some video and um, maybe uh, we'll get uh, Patty to be my consultant. <laughs> Go have me on first. But I do want to have you on because, um, you know, it's, uh, you're a good dude and, and you, you know, we have, uh, we, we've known each other for a long time and, and it's, uh, you know, I respect your opinion and, and you have a different take on, on a lot of stuff. And I think that's, that's really the best is, is when people have different takes. If, if we always agree on everything, Larry Lunin is one of our big listeners. Larry's a great dude and Larry's been around forever. And he's like, you guys agree too much. So every once in a while we have to come up with a, <laughs> a, a, a disagreement, but, uh, and, and I've been writing a, a, the, the going in circles digest, which I did every day during the uh, Saratoga meet. And, I was kind of blown away by how much support I got for that, man. We, we had 1,500, almost some, some days, 2,000 downloads. That's crazy. You know, Great man, it, it, was, uh, it was fun doing it. Got, by the end of the meet, it was, it was a little tiring because it's just, you know. Every day. I'm old. Yeah. But, um, At least it's not six days a week anymore. It's only five. All, all, all those witty things I have to say, you know, I ran out of them <laughs> by about like driver's day. But uh, no, it was great, and, and I, I still do that on Fridays. Um, but uh, yeah, go, that's a going in circles uh, digest dot substack dot com, which is a, a mouthful. But no, but um, that's great, and yeah. you you should be be getting that kind of recognition for your 
for your Twitter feed as well, because you're one of the most educational guys in the business. And it's great like, to have those, those thoughts into one place, whether it's the Substack or whether it's the podcast. But we got to wrap this up, up because someone's going to cut Chuck's lights off, I think. I think Chuck didn't pay his electric bill or something. It's getting very yeah. dark over there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm starting not to recognize Chuck as much as I did in the beginning of the interview. But my, my guy, uh, I love you. I, it's so much good to talk to you. Say hi to your dad because I really miss him. And, and thanks for coming You're out, my man. Thank you for having me. It was great. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Show. Great time. Awesome. Last time on Better Things, I came up heartbreakingly empty, beating a neck out of the pick three thanks to another uncompetitively ridden New York turf race. Stop me if you've heard that before. I did give out Dancing Buck and the Belmont Turf Sprint, if you listen carefully. So I'll count that as a dub for the show and my pride, even if the ledger doesn't reflect it. Probably should have just gone all in both legs in the pick three where I singled Dancing Buck. So basically, while I haven't had an outstanding day since the first installment of the series, I have been over the target just about every episode, but find myself with a small deficit of $95.65 thanks to a combination of bad luck, questionable wagering decisions, and the restrictions of having specific races to bet. Such is often the horse, pe- horse player's lament. Good opinion, middling results. But there's always another opportunity tomorrow if you can remain clear-headed. This week, that opportunity takes us to beautiful, historic, bucolic Keeneland. The Keeneland Fall Meet is one of the most special and scenic race meets in America, if not the world. As dear to my heart as the Belmont Fall Championship meet, and even Belmont at the Big A are, the backdrop and the racing at Keeneland in the fall are both second to none. The quality is certainly evident in looking at the fields for our six Breeders' Cup winning year in challenge races this Saturday and Sunday. We'll start with the Saturday races, the Grade 2 Thoroughbred Club of America Stakes, the Grade 1 Claiborne Breeders' Futurity, and the Grade 1 Coolmore Turf Mile. The three races, which can all be seen on CNBC, from 5 to 6 Eastern this Saturday, October 8th, feature fields of 9, 12, and 12 as part of an all-graded stakes pick five that also includes the grade one first lady and grade two Woodford. I'm going to keep it simple Saturday. Just pick one horse to bet each of the first two races and then play a pace-dependent five-horse exacta box in the turf mile. Try to get lucky there. In the TCA, I'm playing the race to fall apart a bit with three or four speeds signed on. I'm taking a shot with a bomb and number one, Little Tootsie, Great name, by the way. She she might be a bit too slow to win this, but she ran the best race of her life two back in the groupie doll at Ellis, where she made a sustained wide bid all the way around the far turn. She kept on well enough in the stretch to win it by a length and a half. She was a distant third in the Locust Grove Stakes last out at Churchill, but that was a salty field, and that was going two turns. This is clearly a one-turn filly. I thought about going with number two, Palm Cottage, but she has three speeds to her outside after two wire-to-wire wins. She'll have to work out a trip whereas little Tootsie can just drop back from the rail and make one run, and she'll be at least three times the price of Palm Cottage. So I'm betting little Tootsie $20 to win in place. She should be in the 15 to 20 to 1 range. So if she does if she does get there, it's going to be worthwhile. I'm also playing the Breeders' Futurity to fall apart as well, although it's a bit more difficult to come from far back in the short stretch, going a mile and a 16th on the dirt at Keeneland. That's why I'm interested in number 10, Lost Ark, who's a half-brother to presumptive champion Nest. He's got enough speed to lay close without being burnt up if they go 22 and change and 46 and change up front. He was pretty green in the sapling at Monmouth last out, which worries me a little bit, but he also exploded away with powerful strides in the stretch despite that. And he looks for all the world like a horse who's going to appreciate any added distance, both physically and in pedigree. As an addition to Nest, he's also a half to last year's 10 furlong big cap winner, Idol. He draws outside. I think the kickback he got from the inside post and the sapling added to his greenness. So I think Flavian Pratt should be able to keep him in the clear. And I think despite his relation to Nest, he's going to get lost on the board a bit with a bunch of highly regarded Colts, with big figures and top from top barns in here, hoping for somewhere in the 8-1 to one to 10-1 to one range. So the bet here is $30 to win in place on number 10, Lost Ark. The Coolmore Turf Mile is a dizzying race. I mean, stop me if I'm repeating myself. There's a lot of speed signed on. Number one, Classic Causeway. Number two, Smooth Like Straight. Number five, Masin. Number 10, Some Like It, Some like it Hot Brown. And number 11, Emirati. All should be vying for the lead. Terrific, terrific betting race where you can make a case for a lot of them. So I'm not going to overthink it. I'm just going to box the five horses I like best in the exacta, playing against the main contenders like Santine, who could get caught up on or close to a hot pace, hot pace 
So the play here is a $5 exacta box, number three, Order, Order of Australia, number six, Ivar, number eight, Annapolis, number nine, Casta Creed, and number 12, Set Piece, for a total of $100. Total invested for Saturday's races, an even $200. Sunday, we've got three more winning your in qualifiers. The Indian Summer Stakes, which is in the Juvenile Turf Sprint Division. The Grade 2 Castle and Key Bourbon Stakes in the Juvenile Turf Division. And the Grade 1 Judmont Spinster Stakes in the Distaff Division. All of which can be seen from 5 to 6 Eastern on CNBC. It's going to be hard to make real money in the Indian Summer or the Spinster with legitimate heavy favorites in each. But this is the last call for Breeders' Cup Challenge races, so let's give it a go. In the Indian summer, it's very hard to get past the Philly, number five, Love Reigns, whose three races tower over the rest of this field. The only potential knock on her that I can see is she appears to have missed the work between her September 11th and September 24th breezes, but that's not enough to make me play against her for real. I'll bet a $20 exacta, five Love Reigns over number seven, Nona Hudson, number six, Monsieur Coco, and number 11, Private Creed for a total of $60. In the bourbon, I'm on number nine, Gigante, who was very, very impressive, winning the Kitten's Joy Stakes by six and three-quarter lengths last out. I'm hoping the race stays intact and, and there's no also eligibles that draw in because the only other early speed resides on the also eligible list. And with the 12 set to go as is, Gigante is supposed to be nice and loose on the lead. Underneath him, the possibilities are pretty much endless. It's a really good betting race. Fascinating, in fact. So I'm not going to get cute. I'm going to do a 50-cent trifecta at nine with all with all for a total of $55. In the five-horse spinster, the favorites are legitimate. And number one, Malathot, and number three, Latruska, who are an incredible 27 for 39 combined in their careers. Talk about wind machines. The only possible alternative is the progressive number four, Played Hard, who's won three of her last four. She posted a career-high 99 buyer in winning the Locust Grove by five and three-quarter lengths last out. I like her in particular because I don't think Latruska – quite the same horse this year as last year and if not played hard is going to get the jump it's choosing me the first to pounce she's going to get the jump on Malathot so I do think she's a little bit interesting again with a five horse field it'll be tough to get paid but I think played hard considering the the presence of the two favorites will probably be a solid seven to two or four to one so I'm playing a 40 40 dollars to win on number four played hard and an extra and excuse me in a ten dollar exacta box number one Malathot number four played hard and then a ten dollar saver punch Number one, Malathot, and number three, Latruska, overplayed hard. Total invested in the race is $80. Total invested for the day is $195. Add that with the $200 we invested on Saturday. We're in for $395 this weekend, so let's get it. Best of luck. Enjoy the phenomenal action at Keeneland with six Breeders' Cup tickets being punched from 5 to 6 Eastern on CNBC both Saturday and Sunday. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of Better Things with Joe Bianca. Thank you so much to Chuck Simon for coming on, talking to me for a while. If you haven't listened to the Going, Cir Going in Circles podcast, don't usually plug other podcasts, but that's definitely worth listening to with Chuck and Barry. They do a great job. So thanks to Chuck for stopping by. Thanks to the Breeders' Cup for their sponsorship. Thanks to our producer, Patty Wolf, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. We'll see you next time. We'll be back Breeders' Cup week for a big Breeders' Cup preview show here on Better Things with Joe Bianca. See you then.